All right. So I guess for the sake of time, and since um, there's already somebody signed in on Zoom, um, oh, here comes some more people. Um, I'll just go ahead and uh, get started uh, as soon as everybody sits down who just entered. Um, and I guess to begin, uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who made it out here for this. Um, this is the first of what will hopefully be many um, workshops provided to the Neomed community, both students, faculty, and staff, um, in order to show you guys certain uh, techniques and tricks and um, really how to use library resources to their uh, max. So today's session, in case anybody wasn't clear, it's on uh, searching in the new PubMed and also the old PubMed, um, which I'll get to in a second, why for the time being, we kind of need to focus on both. Um, so, Maybe I'll just wait, actually. Uh, so if everybody, I already said this to the other people who entered the room, but anybody who doesn't have their own personal device, I'd suggest uh, pulling out a computer from the slot, um, which all you have to do is just lift up the thing and slide it up. OK. Um, and I guess as a general note for today's presentation, I'm going to try and keep it informal. Um, this is going to be a hands-on workshop that hopefully involves participation from as many people as possible. So feel free to ask questions as I proceed um, and feel free to follow along when I do live um, online demonstrations. So without further ado, I'll get started. Um, so let's see, can this actually go? Okay. There we go. Okay, so to start, I'm just gonna go over what the object objectives and the agenda will be for today. So uh, to get things started, even though I know I'll be preaching to the choir, I'm gonna go over the importance of PubMed uh, for biomedical research um, and any sort of general health sciences research. Um, thinking about the differences and the similarities between the legacy versus the new PubMed. Um, and really this is gonna be necessary because for the time being, you have both the historic version, um, the legacy version as I'll call it, and you have the new interface, um, which just got launched, I think, at the beginning of the new year. Um, they had the PubMed labs for a while, but now you have both versions alongside each other. And sometimes it gets a little confusing, um, as I'll explain. Um, and then we're really going to go into thinking about um, both basic searching and then comprehensive or advanced searching within PubMed. And uh, this is sort of the, I mean, the crux of what I tell students and faculty is. Uh, thinking about a basic search versus an advanced search, um, they both have their time and place. And I think that advanced searching within the realm of, say, grant applications or comprehensive literature reviews um, for any sort of longitudinal research project, um, you really want to be looking into the advanced search features. So I'm going to do a brief overview with also some uh, time for you guys to have some time to do some searching on your own to really get into what that means versus just searching within PubMed as you would search in Google. Um, a lot of people indicated that they're interested in setting up search alerts, so I'm gonna go into that. Um, that involves using the MyNCBI. Um, there's also gonna be some time to look at how to access full text holdings through PubMed, for those of you who aren't familiar. Um, and then uh, our ILL expert on site, Laura Caldwell, is gonna speak about um, interlibrary loan and thinking about also exporting results into a citation manager. And to begin, this is gonna be the more um, talk heavy portion um, versus live demonstration because really it's going to be twofold. I'm talking about the new version of PubMed, then followed by thinking about search methodologies. I just wanted to mention that this is all based on what I heard from you guys. So even though this is hard to read, um, the two, based on the feedback you submitted in the survey, people are most interested in the new PubMed interface, um, and then also thinking about how to access uh, full text. Um, the less popular ones were the MyNCBI um, and the MeSH terms. I guess the thing to note with both of those is that to use my NCBI or to set up search alerts, you do need to have my NCBI. So we're going to have to talk about that. Um, one kind of relies on the other. And then when you're thinking about um, advanced searching in PubMed, this tab here, that almost always, in my opinion, involves using mesh terms. So um, fortunately, you guys indicated that you're kind of interested in all the topics, um, which makes it kind of harder for me because we have a lot of ground to cover, as I just showed in that objective slide. So um, 
as I was saying, like just to get started thinking about the broader picture here, I know that probably everybody in this room is familiar with why it's important to use PubMed. And you most likely, I mean, I guess raise your hand if you use it more like on a weekly or even a daily basis. Um, I realize that that is the case across this campus. Um, but just in case anybody isn't aware, um, PubMed does have what is arguably the largest collection of biomedical citations um, on earth. It's created and maintained by the National Library of Medicine, Bethesda, right outside of DC. Uh, the government spends hundreds of millions of dollars each year to support this very important resource um, and all the subject description uh, that, is, that goes into classifying every single medical article that's published. Um, it also, I mean, this kind of gets at what I was just saying. I mean, that's what I was just mentioning. There's the mesh terms, um, and then it allows for more advanced searching than other databases. So uh, I hope you guys were already aware if you weren't. Um, so thinking now about the new PubMed, which I know a lot of you are very interested in, um, I mean, the question is why should we have to use the new PubMed? And I think the obvious answer is because the other one's gonna be sunset. But I did just kind of want to dwell on this because, uh, when you think about it, the, the old PubMed has been working just fine. And I really think this is a case where it's not necessarily that they're like tearing down what's been created and saying this is the new um, way of using PubMed. As you'll see in a second, this is gonna be very similar to the more traditional legacy version of PubMed, um, which I was kind of excited about because I was stressed that it was gonna be much more of a learning curve for everybody on this campus. Um, so really what they changed is on the back end, without getting too technical, they switched it to uh, cloud computing versus being stored on site. Um, so we really don't need to know that. Um, the, the more important changes are with the aesthetic looks, the, the usability, the interface, um, as I'm showing here. So this is an example of the new PubMed interface. Um, they've kept things sim um, similar in my opinion. Um, everything is moved to the cloud, and then the user interface is switched. I mean, just right off the bat, if you look, if you're familiar with the old interface, they switched a few things around, which might get a little tricky and get, take a little time to get used to. Um, definitely the, having the chart with the dates is um, something I noticed right off the bat. Um, if people are familiar with sorting, there still is a sort feature. It's just been moved to another location. Um, so, and I'll get into a live demonstration in a sec, uh, but just also pointing out some additional features, and this has been uh, talked about for a while. Um, some new features that you'll probably appreciate from a research and like dissemination um, standpoint is they now do allow for easier citation options. Um, previously in PubMed, you could not easily extract uh, the citation um, which was kind of unusual. Um, it's easy to share uh, via permalinks, Facebook, or Twitter. Um, one feature that I really like that I've noticed um, is if you notice here, uh, it is much easier to browse. You can go from next result to next result. Um, unlike previously, you always had to switch back and forth. Um, let's see, did I get everything? So there's also more um, links. So previously, you could only have two, so now three will show up. Um, which is a convenient feature if you are at multiple institutions. And I'll get into how you could set that up in a second. Um, and another major change, if anybody uses the mobile app, which I'm guessing most people don't because it wasn't the greatest app, uh, they sun they're, sen they're sunsetting that and it's just gonna be one interface that you look at on your mobile device and now it'll scale much better. Um, I heard recently that it's about 50% of traffic to PubMed is through the mobile interface. So it's supposed to be much better for full text linking as well. Um, so here's the point where I'll just have to cover some um, basics about how to access PubMed for those of you who aren't familiar, specifically when you're at NeoMed. Um, so does this look familiar to everybody accessing it? So accessing PubMed, you can access it through Google but you don't wanna do that because you're not gonna get the full text links that we provide to you as the library. So you'll wanna go, I mean, you can click this link. That's gonna take you to the legacy version. Um, what we advocate for, and this is where I've put the uh, new PubMed link, 
um, is within our LibGuides landing page. So how about, I'll uh, show you once, I'll, sh I'll go into a live demonstration here. So if we go to Neomed Library, and please feel free to follow along at this point. So from this page, this kind of has a, it doesn't have the most comprehensive set of information about the library. What we've put together is this landing page for all of you guys, um, which, okay, sorry, I'm going too fast. Okay, so if you go to the main library website within the university website, and then if you click on this link or this link, I know it might be just personal preference, but I'm always going to just Google Neomed library and then just click. Um, so um, for those who prefer to go, yeah. Um, could, could you actually go and advocate for putting a link where you PubMed on the page where you can see the staff and faculty? Mm -hmm. That there's a bunch, there's, there's lots of links there. This is really many layers deep, but if you put it, if you go to the Neomed homepage and you go to faculty staff, there are lots and lots of you'll see the places for the link. And there's you, some quick, quick links at the bottom. And if you can just get PubMed added there. They took the library off of there. It, well, that's very frustrating. Right. It's what well, it actually, I think it might have been revised because now it is here with campus resources. Okay. Um, but I mean, I could, I'd be happy to advocate for this. Yeah. So, I mean, I would love if there's a campus wide pitch to put the library up <laughs> at the top of the browsers. Um, we've been kind of hidden, which isn't unusual across other universities. Um, again, I mean, if people feel comfortable with it, uh, I'd suggest just Googling Neomed Library and then landing there um, and then bookmarking it. But I know that some people prefer to start at the landing page, in which case, um, if you aren't comfortable doing like control find, it can be kind of annoying to locate the link for the library. Um, we're recording this, we'll send it to marketing and PR. Um, so if we go back here and if you look, so for the time being, I haven't switched this search box to the new PubMed because they're still fixing some hiccups. You occasionally run into me and Laura have noticed things with ILL. And really today, it's gonna to be confusing at times because there's the new PubMed and there's, there's the old PubMed and they seem to sort of switch between each other at times based on your cookies and your browser. Sometime in the spring, they've indicated, the folks at the National Library of Medicine, that the legacy version is just gonna reroute to the new version, at which time we won't even have to change anything when you hit this search button it's just gonna to go to the new version. So to make it easier, we've decided not to upend anything and just put this link down here. So the new version of PubMed, it has our outside tool to find full text links um, embedded within the URL structure. So when you click on it, um, if you look up here, you should see something different than just pubmed.gov, but don't worry about looking. You can be ensured that you're getting to the right place. When you're off campus, um, to bring up another thing that's really important to know about the way the library works, you will see a proxy screen. Um, is everybody comfortable with logging in from off campus to the library? Okay. Are you a student or are you? Yeah, I'm a student. Okay, so that should be, it should be easier if you know your student ID. I'll, um, I had this in the slide. So the, for faculty, it's your banner ID, which is within banner. Most people don't know it off the top of their head. For students, it's your last name and your student ID. So I'll click on this, because this is the one link on campus that shows the login screen. So when you reach here, if people want to test that, um, you'd have to do it on your mobile device unless you copy and paste that login. But when you're on campus, we have a full network that just authenticates you for everything, and it's great. We realize that that gets a little confusing when you're off campus. Um, because you might just Google PubMed and then say, where's the full text finder? So this is an important thing to be aware of with the library. Um, I think someday 
we'll probably have it synced up with campus-wide login, but that might be a while from now. So at the moment, um, we know that it's an ID, especially for students that they should know. So, so, so there's no APF, it's just logging in into your library account and then you access. Yes, correct. Um, and I know, for example, on my MacBook at home, I mean, I use off-campus access because I test things. And even for Windows, cookies remember it really quickly. Um, and in my opinion, it's sort of a password login that doesn't really matter because it's not going to be, I hope that nobody's trying to steal your student ID. Um, so if you start using it on your computer, it should start to remember it. Um, so like, yeah, it's the top of my head. I don't know my computer ID. I just yeah. have heard from people that they're using VPNs, but I remember you, I couldn't have a point that you said about that. This so, is different. So now I'm, I'm figuring that there's no VPN in the I can show you what your library ID is. So yeah. that way you can end up into the point. Great. So, I mean, we can, yeah. Anyone feel free to stop by the help desk after if you need help with your library credentials. Um, so now that we've thought about logging in, um, we can now get to searching within the new PubMed and thinking about how to use it. So I just want to go back here and stay on track. So um, the other thing to do um, with PubMed, especially if we're working on a long-term research project, but also just for ensuring that you get our full text links, is to use the MyNCBI account. Um, a lot of you said that you're very interested in search alerts. In order to get search alerts, you need to create a MyNCBI account. So I'm going to show you really quickly, um, for the sake of time, how to do that. And then we'll have an activity break, and I can go around and help people. So um, let me actually go back for a second. So right here from the new landing page, when you click log in in the upper right-hand corner, um, do people have accounts already with MyNCBI? Great, we have one, a um, couple people. So you can create your own. Um, let me actually go into, it looks like the cookies have remembered, so one second. So um, so normally when you click it, it'll show up like this for the first time. So what you wanna click on is right here, my NCBI account. And then once you're there, other login options. Oh, new here, sign up. So then you would click create new my NCBI account. It doesn't need to be attached to anything, it's just whatever you want it to be. So I'll log into mine. And the thing to note here. When you do go to it, um, is it's going to look like the legacy version of PubMed, even though this is a separate database than PubMed. Um, the big surprise for me with the new PubMed interface is that they are not updating the other um, National Library of Medicine databases. So like the MeSH database is not going to be updated. It's going to flow freely between the new PubMed interface and the MeSH. And the same goes for my NCBI. So this won't change. It'll still look this way. And any search updates you've had in the past will stay. They're not going to get wiped. Um, so as you can see, it's a bit of a dashboard feature. Um, like right here, I have a few PubMed searches that I get updates on. Um, you can also create my bibliography, which is popular with researchers, especially like postgraduates. People are trying to keep track of their research and easily share it. Um, it keeps a log of all your recent activity, which is helpful. Um, PubMed in general keeps track of your searches on a single computer for up to 12 hours at a time, um, which is convenient. You don't have to be logged in for that. But if you want to see what you were searching the previous day, this keeps track of it. So right here you see February 7th and it's still there. Um, you can also create collections of items. So it's really a convenient tool. And as everybody indicated, this is the search alerts and it goes directly to your email. I'll show that in a little bit. I just wanted to show this first because the other thing to keep track of is you can sync it up with the outside tool. 
So I'll just do a sample search here. Let's see. Um, um, let me go back to the slides actually. So within my NCBI preferences, I tried to just get it from the PubMed page, but I'll show you in a sec within the my NCBI. You can go into what's known as PubMed preferences and click on this thing called outside tool and set it to Northeast Ohio Medical University. And that'll especially save it on your computer. So you're always going to be logged in on your computer and the full text icons are going to show up. Um, so if we go back here and go up here to this link, you can look. And this is where if you have another institution that you prefer, I don't know if anybody here works, say it, SUMA or something, but I'm just gonna search. So this is Northeast Ohio Medical University. Can everyone see that? Is this making sense? Okay, um, let me zoom in. So there we go. So I can show you in the break, but basically I just showed you within my NCBI preferences, you can go in and you can select and you can save the university you belong to. I mean, even on campus, this is going to make a difference because if for some reason you get a link to a PubMed article from a collaborator and you open that, if you're signed into your My NCBI account, what's going to show up is this link here. This link here is going to be the full text. Um, in this case, it's an open access article, so you're seeing a PubMed Central free full text. But in a lot of cases, you're seeing articles that cost money, and unless you're logged in through our proxy, you're not going to be able to get access to them. So, for example, if you click here, it's going to take you to something which hopefully loads. This is the, yep, so there you go. So I'll zoom in right here. So this is something we maintain, and it can find an article or a book, and it allows you to either access it within our full text holdings, or as we'll talk about a little later, it allows you to request it. And this applies to all articles and any sort of publication. <coughs> so I know the people on campus who do know about interlibrary loan use it a lot. And the people who don't tend to get excited when I tell them about it. So um, during the activity session, we can circulate and we can show you these steps. Um, but I want to go back to the new PubMed interface now and think about some of the basic features it has. So um, probably the, the number one feature when you're thinking just about basic searching, so not searching with uh, Boolean operators or mesh terms or quotation marks or any of that, is the improved um, citation search algorithm. So as I'll show in a second, it's much easier to just search, say if you have a list of 20 separate citations in a bibliography, to pop those in and get it, even if you don't have all the information, um, say if you just have the DOI. Um, and so what I'm gonna do as a quick demo is show that right now, and then show a couple of other features based on that. So actually, let's just go here to show that really quick because I think it was already in there. So just put in the full citation, um, it comes up. And I guess the point is if you have a part of the citation and there's also improved author searching. So basically all the features that probably a lot of you have used in the past, PubMed now claims, the National Library of Medicine vouches that it's an improved experience now, that the algorithms are better. Um, so like let's look at some of these features so now there's an easier way to cite which is pretty common in most databases until recently it wasn't um, all that available we've already looked at the outside tool linking a full text um, this share feature is convenient um, i've noticed especially if you're off campus i noticed last night if you do that share link you're going to get a proxy link to our resources so if you share that with somebody else who's in neomed they'll be guaranteed to get the full text finder icons um, the other thing I wanted to point out, and this really gets into thinking about uh, research, um, specifically research data. Um, I'll do that again, just so everyone's familiar. Um, so supplemental resources 
are a great addition to any sort of publication. Um, researchers making their data sets open to encourage reproducibility and just sort of transparency around the methodology. Um, within this new version, I've noticed that there are, say, linking out to Dryad, which is a data repository. So a lot of studies that you do find, I encourage you all to check to see if that's available. And in this case, it's about um, dog phenotypes, but here, like if we were to download the publication or the data publication, it's gonna probably provide us with a large document which provides an <laughs> overview of the data set. So um, there we go. So if we go back to this single entry, um, the other thing to notice is that they have, I know there was a little bit of this in the previous PubMed, but now there's a lot more citation chaining. So it shows you who's cited the article going forward. Yeah, until recently, this was only available in Web of Science and then Google Scholar started following, but more recently databases such as Scopus um, and now PubMed has really started using that intelligence to see who cited the work after it was published. So this one has a fairly healthy dose of 53 citations. So you can click on it and there you go. Um, if we do the author search without doing any sort of commands, um, you'll see that a lot of, that's a convenient feature as well. So the other thing I'd point out just again is I do appreciate that now there's the next result. Um, so you're able to just sort of navigate quickly between. So are there any questions about what I've just covered? I'll go back for a sec. Um, so thinking about going forward, um, and this sort of, I know we're sort of running behind, but this wraps up the first portion of the presentation and workshop. Um, they've said it should become the default in spring of 2020. The thing I should note is that they've said that the new PubMed would be launched about a year ago. It was about a year behind schedule. So it might be later than they say it will be. Um, so I guess just stay tuned. Eventually it will um, default over. Um, and I watched a webinar recently where they mentioned that it's just the beginning. They're gonna keep working to improve this continually. Um, not so much in terms of like drastic changes, but just really um, they see it as a work in progress as I think any um, major system should. Um, and as I mentioned, it's important to realize that the uh, mesh and my NCBI are gonna stay the same and that your search alerts are not gonna be um, wiped. So here's the break for an activity. So I thought I'd give you guys all about five minutes. We can do longer if you guys would prefer to sort of give you an opportunity to start poking around within the new PubMed. Um, we can help with any of these. So exploring a citation or a keyword search. Um, if anybody has questions about how to access full text, um, the supplemental resources, um, creating a My NCBI account, um, we can, or I can circulate. Denise and Laura are help, welcome to help. Um, but does that sound good to you, all of you? Yeah. If, if not, I can keep going with the presentation. Yeah, do you have a question? Yeah, for sure. So the question was for those listening on Zoom is how to get to the um, sync up the NeoMed library uh, link out with your MyNCBI account. So I'll demonstrate that for the group. Um, so if we go here just to the PubMed, you'll first want to get in to your MyNCBI account. And then you have to click. Um, probably if you just go here and click account settings, this should bring it up. Um, and then down here. So are you still with me? Wait. So right here, if you go under NCBI site preferences, and then if you click on this outside tool link, It's going to bring up a really long list in alphabetical order. Um, you could click on the N or do, I tend to do just control F 
and then Northeast Ohio Medical University. Check the bubble. So this is actually something that I was confused by because they, the people at the National Library of Medicine were saying, oh, you can set it up with multiple outside tools. So that would be a great asset for us. They said, you know, people could have like Summa Health's full text finder show up and Neomeds within their MyNCBI preferences. The only thing is when I wanted to go and test that, I'm gonna have to like contact somebody because when I went to go and test it, it's a what's known as a radio button. When you click on one, it goes from one to the other. So it doesn't appear to me that I'm able to click on multiple. So for everybody in the room, um, I would hope that just Northeast Ohio Medical University is your preference. So um, select that one single bubble. And then when you're done, click save. So once you have that set up and you're logged in and you save it on your device, the full text will always show up. Um, it won't require you to log into our proxy until you click on our full text finder, at which point it will say. So I guess it prevents you from always having either bookmarking the link or going back. Uh, are there any other questions? So Do you guys want five minutes to explore things on your own or do you want me to just keep going? I'll, okay, I'll keep going. Okay, so this is the second half, which I'll probably go through in a faster pace than I anticipated, um, which is thinking about basic searching versus advanced searching in PubMed in general. Um, so, I'm guessing the majority of you, based on the students I've met with, faculty, et cetera, um, you're probably familiar with searching PubMed just like we showed before, um, either by a single citation or a few keywords strung together. Um, and what I'm gonna advocate for is definitely that, um, when you're starting out any sort of research project to just see a quick skim of the literature. Um, and in a second, I'll demonstrate a couple of those um, brief little keyword strings. Um, but on the flip side of that, I will also argue that there should be questions asked um, when you do search by that approach, because you might have a narrow topic and you might enter, as will be the case with the first one, um, aterostatin and memory loss. It's not a very general topic. It's not like searching for a specific type of cancer and finding 20,000 articles on that. Um, and that's a whole nother a can of worms, and that's why I put up this separate example here, um, which is Staphylococcus uh, and RAS drug resistance mechanisms. Um, so that's a very specific topic again, but there's been a lot of publications on it. And I think the argument I make in both cases when I meet with um, students and researchers is that probably whether or not it's a narrow set of results of 60 results based on a keyword search, or if it's a broad set of results, um, of 20,000 based on a keyword search, you're probably still missing important articles when you do start to refine it. Um, because we wanna be comprehensive in our search. And what I can show you in the next 10 to 15 minutes are some tips and tricks that should hopefully allow you to build the search strategy in a more comprehensive way using both keywords and subject headings. Um, and that at the end of the day, as I can demonstrate by putting in the um, search strings that I'll demo here, uh, it does bring up either a more specific set of results or um, I guess results that are more on target out of, um, if it's a narrow set of results, it typically brings up slightly more results. And if it's a really broad set of results based on a keyword search, it often narrows it quite a bit. Um, so I hope at least with the students and researchers that I've met with, that's always been a good thing. Um, and I also always vouch for, I mean, we are a very specific field. We are talking about evidence-based, um, whether it's in research or it's in the clinical um, areas of our work. Um, and the idea is to look at all the evidence that's been published. So it's a pretty easy argument to say, well, there's nothing been published on this. And the argument from my standpoint would be, well, how do you know you've really found everything that's been published on a specific topic? 
Um, and I think the, the extreme version, what I'm going to show you, I don't consider to be extreme search strategies, um, even though they might look a little extreme. The extreme would be like a Cochrane review search strategy, which is often, say, a medical librarian up at like Cleveland Clinic spending months working on a search strategy, going through all the hierarchies they can and developing a search strategy that will last about a page in length. And that's typically what requ is required these days in order to get published in a Cochrane review. What I'm gonna show you is more of a middle road that should hopefully only take about 20 minutes, but um, in the uh, 10 to 15 minutes we have remaining, I might not get to all of it. Um, so it might, re might require some additional meetings. And the other point to make is that for faculty and staff, this is a service that I offer to them. For students, I offer this as an instructional and training capacity. So um, just keep that in mind. Um, so for the sake of time, I won't pop in either of those keyword searches, but basically one showed 60 results, the other showed 20,000 results. Um, so this is kind of just more of like a, a joke of a slide to show what I consider to be the seven steps for effective advanced searching in PubMed. Um, and I'll rather quickly go through each one of them, which is identifying search concepts using PICO or whatever relevant non-clinical approach you need to sort of parse out your different concepts. Um, the next one is we, I always encourage, and I've always been trained in this way to start with um, MeSH terms. So the medical subject headings that are maintained by the National Library of Medicine and applied to pretty much every article that goes through PubMed. So, Starting in this database, as I'll show in a second, really provides a strong foundation for thinking about all possible synonyms, and it leads into building a comprehensive set of keywords. So when you search with both of those, in theory, you should be searching the most comprehensive way of defining a certain concept, not mesh terms um, or uh, mm -hmm. keywords, but mesh, words, mesh terms and keywords together in a single search string. So it's the X, Y, Z um, variables. Um, so then that, those are the first two steps, or the second and third steps. Then the fourth step is to combine, as I was just saying, and search those as a single concept. And then the fifth step is to repeat that for additional concepts. Usually in my mind, a good search will have um, two to three concepts. So you build up search strings for each one, and at the end, you combine them all using the Boolean operator and, um, and then you go in and you start refining them. So, as I always also tell students and faculty is, whenever you do conduct these sorts of searches, even though I just showed you the My NCBI account, which saves every search, I always, and I do this myself, I tell um, people doing these searches to open a Word document. Start copy and pasting the search strategy as you go along to sort of set it out as just basically one giant math equation. And you can save that and then later you can translate it to additional databases, which is an additional thing that I tell students, faculty and staff to do all the time. So, I mean, the other thing to add to that is uh, think about Zotero um, or EndNote or RefWorks is a good way to manage the citations you find and deduplicate them. So, if we think about this sample search topic, um, the first step would be to identify the search concepts. So if we say, what does the literature say on the connection between aterostatin and memory loss? Um, you could parse this out and think about the patient population, but really what it boils down to for me are two concepts. So you have aterostatin and you have memory loss. So building off of what I just said, you're gonna to wanna to build comprehensive concepts, search strings for each concept. Um, so what I'm gonna show and then demonstrate um, is building those concepts and the strategy I just defined, which is to begin looking at mesh terms, which again are controlled vocabularies. Um, if anybody's not familiar, it's a controlled way of defining a single concept. So neoplasms for cancer versus the 20 different ways of saying cancer. Um, that's a very popular one. I know that the comparison to hashtags is sometimes easy because it's a way of sort of um, reining everything in um, and entering it as a single concept. Um, and the controlled vocabulary within the National Library of Medicine PubMed is MeSH. When you go to other databases such as CINAHL, there's CINAHL headings or psych info headings. Really a lot of databases use their own what are just known as the SORI in order to define the subjects within that field. Um, 
for medicine, it makes the most sense to me to start with um, mesh. So this is where, maybe I'll pop this in for the sake of time. So I was gonna show memory loss, but I'll show a demo of aterostatin. So similar to what this screenshot shows right here, if we go to PubMed again, so this is where the two meet. So we're on the new interface. If you scroll down here and click on the mesh database, it takes you to the legacy. And this will stay the same with the new PubMed. So all we have to do, even though it's in all caps, is just type in iterstatin. And let's actually, is this, can everybody see this okay? I apologize if anybody can't. Um, but so here's, you're gonna see the mesh terms. Um, Sometimes you will find additional mesh terms that seem to make more sense just based on your initial search. Sometimes it will default take you to the mesh entry. Um, once you find the mesh term you like, click on it and go to the entry. You'll see here that there's gonna be a definition, what's called a scope note, which clearly defines the concept and it's a good way, um, especially for concepts you aren't familiar with, to make sure that you're looking at the correct thing. Um, the other thing, to note is if you scroll down, you can see the hierarchical structure of where all this fits in. So mesh is a giant tree of terms that has broader terms and narrower terms, and you can scale them up. So sometimes when you're searching on a topic and you can't find anything, that's the point where I would say to take it up to the next level in the, like the, the term. And sometimes, as is the case here, it's within multiple trees because you find concepts applying to different like especially public health topics. It's either gonna be um, epidemiology or more of the specific public health realm. Um, so going back to how to search for this term, um, this is the one thing that I find always takes a little while to get used to, and it's not gonna change. So um, the first thing you click is just add to search builder, and that pops in the mesh term. The next part, so this is all we do with mesh. Um, you don't need to think about any other mesh terms at this point. You just have the single term for the single concept, the first of our two concepts. The next part is to think about keywords. So this is where always to begin, you're gonna use the exact same as the mesh term. And that's because some articles are gonna be classified with the mesh term and some are gonna be classified with just keywords. It takes a while for the National Library of Medicine's indexers to apply mesh terms. So in theory, you're gonna find some articles that might not have keywords assigned and you're gonna catch that through the mesh term. And in other cases, you're gonna find articles that just have the keywords and don't have the mesh term. We wanna use both. So let me just go into the slides really quick to show a visual for anybody who's not familiar with thinking about Boolean logic. Um, just to define how we're gonna combine these. So Boolean logic is and, or, or not. Um, the easiest way to remember it, most people I've met on this campus has been very quick um, to grasp this, but in my mind it's always or is more um, and is less because you're saying you want results that contain like pies, for example, um, apple pies versus a narrow set of all the pies that specifically have say apples, um, blueberries, and peaches within the single pie, that's a narrower set. <laughs> the other comparison is Simon Says, which is convenient for me. Um, somebody standing up, um, like, you know, the person who has the most um, ands within their profile is gonna be the last person standing. So the most specific results are the ones that have the most ands between single concepts. Okay, so if we keep that in mind, the next step is to start oring in the keywords. So I'll do the first one. And typically what I do, even though you don't need to do this if you don't want to, is I put in a command after that's T-I-A-B. And that, in this case, it's probably not crucial um, because there's probably not too many institutes or journals or author affiliations that have aterbostatin in them. But when you're thinking about say, like cancer terms, you're gonna find a lot of institutes. You don't necessarily want a result that's just been published in the journal 
that has your concept in it or is or has an author that's affiliated with an institute that has that keyword in it you want that keyword in the title or the abstract so it's a more specific way to control it um, again you don't necessarily have to do that if it's too much to remember um, and for the sake of time i'm just going to scroll down here so actually let me go back before i paste this in so the best place to look for all the variations um, is within this entry terms list. Sometimes it's convenient you find a single term that really has never changed. In other cases, such as this, you have all the different drug variations. Sometimes this isn't going to find any results. Sometimes they will. And I think this is a good example. And so if you're doing a quick search for an assignment the next day, you probably don't need to spend all this time going through and orienting all these keywords. What I'd argue to you guys, if you're doing a long-term research project that's gonna spend several months looking at the literature, it probably does make sense to go in and or them all in. Um, or reach out to me and ask for help and I'll suggest the best way to develop that strategy. Um, I mean, that being said, I probably can't scale that to every researcher on this campus. So if you go in, like this is what I developed. Um, so I think sometimes people, it takes a while to get used to just typing into this box, but that's all you have to do. So you type in, and this will be an interesting to see where this takes us. So at the moment, in my experience, based on cookies, sometimes when you hit search PubMed, it takes you to the new PubMed. Sometimes you hit search PubMed and it takes you to the old PubMed. Eventually, it'll just always take you to the new PubMed. So let's see, does it take us? It does, it took us to the new PubMed. So there's the first concept. Um, so we have results, a comprehensive set of results on that single concept. Um, the next step in the time I have would be to build that for memory loss, memory disorders as it's defined in MeSH. So you would do those exact same steps, build it out, into a search strategy and then you would and them in so if i go in here and i apologize i think i put too much onto the plate here but so say we put this in so now you have a lot more results on um, memory disorders the thing to do and i know that sometimes when i did what i just did which is completely just put in a new term people are afraid that the results are going to be lost they don't go anywhere for 12 hours and they don't go anywhere if you're in your my NCBI account. The way to combine the search terms is to go into this advanced page. So, and you'll see the search details here. So first you would add to query. So, and then you would add this one, add with and, because we want search results which have memory disorders and atorvastatin and all those variations together. And the fact, that they're enclosed with parentheses. So you, see, so you see here, it just becomes one giant math equation. So you have parentheses around all this and parentheses around all of that. And so it's gonna find the results where the two overlap. And hopefully, yeah. so then you get 62 results. So this would be an example where again, if we just go in here, a tor the statin memory loss, this is hopefully so 35 results so you can see that the keyword search as i was saying at the beginning brings up usually a narrower set of results and this even applies when you're talking about that other um the staff arius where that brings up tens of thousands but if you build up that concept you're going to get more which sounds kind of irrational when you think about you're trying to get a specific set of results at that point what you'll want to do probably is start to limit by review articles um, and this gets into the limits um, so if we go back here, so if you have 62 results, you probably don't need to limit these. But if we go back here and we look at this additional one that I just put in here, um, even this one is very specific. Actually, let me put that in. So this is two concepts. It's re drug resistance mechanisms and staph aureus. Um, you're going to get 27,000 results. So that's too many results probably. So the first step would be to look to see, okay, review articles. The next step that I often advocate for 
and this is where additional training is probably required, is start to limit it um, by terms in the title. So this is just going to find results. And I've been showing this to students a lot, and they seem to gravitate towards it. And I do it on research to support um, faculty as well. So if you look down here, now I'm looking for results that he have either the term resistant mechanisms or resistant mechanism in the title. So if you're doing a systematic review, this would not be OK, because then you might be excluding important results. If you're doing something for a literature review and you just want to see what the literature says, pulling items out that have certain terms in the title that you want to see, in my opinion, is not, not a bad idea. Um, again, this is where, since I've gone through this in such rapid speed, I would fully advocate for you, anyone who's working on a long-term literature review to reach out to me. So even without, so then you get 69 results. And when you go to review articles, it's 15. So these steps, I hope I haven't been going too quickly, um, but these steps should really, um, as a student put it, avoid having to spend three hours to find three articles. Um, this will probably take you about an hour. I mean, I'm going to send you on your way with some tutorials um, that will allow you to find them more quickly. Um, really quick while we have time, because um, I know that we got kind of sidetracked before, I'm going to hand it over to, I think that clock is fast. OK, yeah, we still have seven minutes. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Laura in just a second so she can talk about ILL. Um, and then we can have time for questions. But I also wanted to just point there are additional um, filters. Sometimes filters can be a double-edged sword. Like if you limit by humans, sometimes we don't necessarily advocate for that from the librarian standpoint. Um, it's better to build a search concept for the type of species or gender that you want to see. Um, but there are definitely, and, and dates are a good limit too. Um, when you do pull full text results, as I was showing before, I'll, when possible, look for our logo within the journal um, publisher. That's a good way to know whether or not you're in the right place um, and that our proxies are working. On campus, they will show up by IP range. Um, and then in cases where you can't find the full text, um, this is where I'm going to hand it over to Laura. This was one of the articles within Statins, The, Burglar's, the Burglar of Memory. Um, it'll show up with this yellow, the article. And then Laura, I'll hand it over to you. And I guess for the people on Zoom, I'll hand you a, the microphone. Hi, everybody. Hope everybody's having a good day. So real quick, I do have a list of everybody's email addresses. So I will send you an email with my presentation. So that way you're able to see what I'm talking about. So the first thing I am going to do here is I am going to open up a web browser. It looked like some of you were searching in the new PubMed, other people were looking in the old PubMed. So for today, because I know the old PubMed is working the way it's supposed to, I'm gonna show you how to search in the old PubMed. So I'm gonna to go to www. if anybody wants to follow along, neomed.edu backslash library. And I'm going to go down and I am going to click on journals, articles, books, and more. What I'm getting ready to show you is how to auto import in any PubMed request into Iliad that you're not able to find a full text copy of, how you drop it from abstract and PubMed, and also how to navigate Iliad and create an Iliad account. And again, everything I'm going to show you, I will send you guys each an email so that way you can do this on your own time. Or if you want have questions, you can always email or call or stop in as well. So I am going to click on, and then we're going to go down to search library collections, the green box. I am going to scroll down and click on the legacy PubMed, the one that everybody is used to right now. I think this is, yeah, it's just defaulting, but if you go, if you click on that top, very shiny. 
I was going to go to the median. I think the cookies, if you go back to the other page, the new pub bed, I believe we just were. And then click on that. Click that down. Okay, I apologize, everybody. So what I'm going to do in this bar, I'm going to search something very simple, ADHD. I'm going to click on search. And from home, what you're going to want to do is authenticate from off campus. So make sure you go in through the library homepage like I just showed you. If you don't know your library ID number, just call, give us a call email us, stop at the help desk, any of us can give that to you. And I'll make sure that everybody has an account so that way you won't have any problems with that. So we aren't seeing anything in full text. So what I always recommend everybody to do is where it says format summary, if you drop that down to abstract, it's going to show you full text of each article or at least if it's not in full text, it'll give you a Northeast Ohio Medical University box. I'm gonna click on that to save time right now. And you're gonna go in and you're gonna click on Iliad for anything you don't see full text of, you can't get the PDF of it, whatever the problem is. So I'm gonna log into my Iliad account. And again, we can show you guys how to do this. I can send you the presentations as well. And it's always when you're in a group of people that you seem to mess up when you're typing. Iliad and PubMed work together. They auto import everything into that field, into the field, so you don't have to do it. If you have specific notes, Laura, I need this in color. Can you get me the supplementary appendix? That's where you add it to notes. And then you would click on submit request. As you will see, once it clicks on submit your, out, your request, it's going to show you everything on the screen here that is an outstanding request. If you receive, once you receive the email from us that your Iliad request is available, click on that email. It's going to take you to the Iliad homepage. You're going to sign in and you're going to click on electronically received articles. Please note that when you click here, everything is available for 30 days. So if you look at it 45 days from now, those articles are no longer going to be there and we would have to reorder this for you. Also over here on the left, this is where you would enter in a new Iliad request. If you needed an article, everything with a red asterisk is where you need to fill in. If you have something that you've been searching, you're looking at old references from papers that you have and you're not in PubMed to automatically import it into Iliad. Uh, you can look at all requests. I need something that I looked at 10 years ago. It will show up in your history. So you're able to see those things from there as well. For time purposes, I'm gonna log off of the accounts. And for those of you who do not have a Iliad account, if you clicked on first time users and follow that step by step and submit information, you will be able to have an Iliad account. Do you have any questions for me? I know I went over that rather fast. I will send everybody that signed in what I just showed you along with your library information, your library username and password. Okay. Sure. All right. So I know there were a couple. If anybody needs to leave for sake of time, um, you're more than welcome. We won't take it personally. Um, and for those who are able to stay, the final thing to go over, just making sure I went over everything. Oh, and like. Okay is the creating the search alert. I know that a lot of you indicated that you're interested in that. Um, fortunately, the National Library of Medicine makes it fairly easy, in my opinion. Um, this is always my 
favorite search to demonstrate. So we'll just do this. Um, so say you wanted to know about all the PubMed results on a regular basis with the term dog. Um, make sure you're just signed into your My NCBI account. Uh, again, if we go back, let me type it in, just show it again for anybody. Um, click create alert. And I'll just go ahead and submit. You have variables. If you want it um, daily, you can get it daily. Um, you can specify when you want it. Um, probably you want to see all the results, although probably not for a concept like this, because you would get thousands. Um, and you can also do that. And then when I click save, there we go. And you can go in and edit that and you can retrieve the results. I know I get updates every once in a while and I go in and I pull the results. Um, so does anybody have any questions about that? Okay, so this is where we weren't so behind on our schedule with the new PubMed. I think that's where we got a little delayed um, is we would have time for you guys to search, but I hope that this overview has given you enough to be able to go off on your own and start searching. Um, the final thing that I'll end on, which is kind of a shameless plug for, uh, uh, the next workshop, which is thinking about how to export like, you know, say 200 articles and then save them into a citation management software. Um, many are familiar with say EndNote or RefWorks. This one's going to um, focus on Zotero, which is a free open source um, desktop, which or desktop client, which operates pretty much exactly like EndNote. In fact, EndNote sued them back in the early 2000s. Uh, <laughs> so it was interesting times. Uh, so that's going to be on Thursday, February 27th at the same time in the same place. So noon to one, um, it is available on our library classes page right here. If you go in right here, um, instruction and curriculum support. So you can go in and you can register. Um, I will start contacting people throughout campus so it can be sent to mailing list, et cetera. Um, but I do know that when I show this to students especially or anybody working on a long-term literature review, it's highly beneficial because it allows you to sync up your bibliography within your manuscript and it saves a lot of time. And deduplication is a lifesaver. So I'll send these slides out to everybody who attended. Um, I'll also check to see if the video actually turned out well. Um, so I'll, we'll be in touch. And thank you for your time. Um, we're, we apologize for running over. Um, and the final plug is that we have tons of